Today we're continuing our mailbag segment with some more real life scenarios to talk through. We're going to talk about coverage provided by a contracted entity, advice for practice administrators on onboarding and offboarding providers, and buying malpractice insurance again after being bare. Stay tuned. Welcome to Malpractice Insights, the show dedicated to helping healthcare professionals understand medical malpractice insurance and providing you with the solutions you need so that you can get back to the work of practicing good medicine. My name is Jennifer Wiggins, CEO of Aegis Malpractice Solutions, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. All right, let's jump in. Question number one in the mailbag today says... I am a CRNA who is transitioning from W-2 status to a 1099 provider. I have an opportunity to contract with a group who will cover my malpractice, but there are a few things that I'm concerned with. First, they are only offering me claims made coverage, and they said that I don't need to buy tail insurance when I leave. Is that right? Second, they say that I do not have consent to settle, but that they will work with me to ensure a positive outcome. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, so a couple of thoughts on this particular situation. First, let's talk about the tail insurance. So when you are working for a large network, um, whether it's a hospital or maybe a multi-specialty group or just a large national provider, oftentimes those groups will be self-insured, which essentially means they do their own malpractice insurance. They don't buy it from a third party um, carrier. Sometimes they will buy it from a carrier, sometimes they'll do it themselves. But usually when it's set up like that, it is done on a claims made basis and you don't have to buy tail insurance when you leave. Now, I know that that sounds contradictory because we've talked about tail insurance at nauseum on the podcast, but here's why you don't. So for an entity like that, basically what they'll do is when you leave the practice or leave the group, they keep you active on what's called a departed schedule. So they'll have a full list of all of the providers that used to work for them, and they're still keeping your coverage active on this departed list. So what they'll do is they'll keep paying for that policy year over year, and then when the time comes that they actually cancel the insurance, either because the practice shuts down or maybe they cancel and move to a different kind of insurance altogether, then they will buy one tail policy and it will cover everybody that ever worked for that entity. The reason why they do this is just because it's simpler. It's simpler to do it that way as opposed to tailing out every single provider that leaves. And when you're working for a large entity where there's a lot of moving parts, there's more opportunity to get that messed up. So for large businesses, it's simpler to just keep people on a departed schedule and then wait and purchase one tail that covers everybody all at the end. So for this particular CRNA, um, she mentioned who the carrier was that was covering them, and it's one of the large, well-established carriers, and so I reassured her that it's not um, uncommon for them to do it this way. So I think she'll be fine when it comes to the tail insurance that's quote-unquote not needed. The second thing she brought up, though, is a little bit more concerning, and that is the fact that she doesn't have consent to settle under this particular policy. So again, when you work for like a large entity, either a hospital or a large network, oftentimes they won't give you full consent to settle because chances are if you get named in a malpractice suit, you won't be the only person named. It will be you, the entity, probably another couple of providers as well. And so they usually limit consent so that they can try to coordinate everything amongst all of the named defendants. So again, it's not uncommon to see this. It's not preferred. Obviously the the best way would be for you to have pure consent. So that way you can really make your own decisions on how you want your claims to be handled. But when you work for an organization that's really large, again, consent is usually a little more limited. So is it preferred? No. Um, Is it uncommon? No. It's actually fairly common for an entity of that size to limit the consent. So really that's just your, your call on whether or not that's something you're comfortable with. My advice to her today, just given the carrier that's currently insuring them, I told her she was probably fine. Um, But again, it's really up to your own risk tolerance. So are you okay not having consent? Are you okay trusting that they're going to buy that tail for you at the end? Um, So 
you know, ask around some other people that might have worked for that organization before. You can probably get some good feedback on how it went. Um, but at the end of the day, neither one of those two things are overly concerning, but something to be aware of. And you'll just have to decide if that's something you're willing to take on when you take on that contract. Long-winded answer for question number one. All right, we're going to move on. Question number two in the mailbag says, Hi, Jennifer. I am a CEO for a radiology group, and we recently terminated employment with a provider that was a little problematic for us. I really want to make sure we don't leave any loose ends with him on the malpractice front. Do you have any advice on how to ensure a clean break and help prevent any backlash for us on something like this? Okay. So I give advice to practice administrators and CEOs fairly regularly, and one of the biggest things that we talk about is just making sure that your employment contract is crystal clear on the expectations when it comes to your malpractice insurance. We've talked about this on the provider side, making sure that you know upfront what kind of policy is being provided for you, who's paying for it, what kind of insurance is it, who's going to buy the tail at the end. Well, the same thing goes into play for the practice as well. So for, for the administrator or the CEO, those things you need to have firmed up from the practice side as well. So my recommendation would be, you know, whether or not this is someone who's problematic or not, you just need to have all of your T's crossed and I's dotted before you bring on a provider. So make sure it is very clear who's paying for the policy, what kind of insurance is it, who's the carrier, if it's going to be a claims made policy, who's going to buy the tail. So when the time comes for that provider to move on, whether it's because they're leaving on their own terms or whether it's because you're dismissing them from your practice, then it is very clear what the next steps are. So if you have told the provider that you will be buying the tail insurance, you need to make sure that you report the cancellation timely and that you secure that tail for them quickly. Um, make sure that it's paid for within the, the allotted time. Normally, you only have 30 to 60 days to buy that tail. So just make sure it gets paid for in time. Secure a copy of the tail endorsement once it's been purchased. And then make sure the provider gets a copy of the tail so that they can rest assured that you've taken care of that for them. Now, on the opposite side, if you have told the provider that it's their responsibility to buy the tail insurance, you know, now it's a little bit more dicey. You're hoping that they do that. There's really nothing you can do to control whether or not they buy that tail. And if they don't buy that tail, it can potentially cause some problems for the practice. So it's definitely better for you if you tell them that you're going to buy the tail because it is within your control, but obviously it costs you more money. If you tell the provider that they have to buy the tail, it doesn't cost you anything, but you do lose control. So you have to make that determination as a business, which of those two positions you're going to take. And again, make sure that that's communicated up front at the time that you onboard somebody so that all of that is very, very clear at the time of termination of what's required going forward. So for this particular CEO, my recommendation to her was just to make sure that the cancellation got reported right away. They got a copy of the cancellation endorsement showing that that provider had been terminated from the policy. We made sure they got their tail quote quickly. We made sure the premium was paid for the tail quote quickly. And then we made sure that the tail endorsement was issued and copies were given to all of the necessary parties. So that's really the best you can do to make sure that everything is taken care of and buttoned up. If you have a situation where the provider is buying their own tail, then you just need to make sure you're really being diligent with your follow-up to make sure that it does indeed get purchased. Okay, last question in the mailbag today says, I am a plastic surgeon in Miami, Florida, and I've been practicing without insurance for three years now. At the time, rates were astronomically high, so going bare was my only option. I'm open to buying malpractice insurance again, but just wanted to see if you think I can find a policy at a more reasonable price now. Okay, so we've talked a few times before about going bare or going without malpractice insurance. You know, and in Florida, unfortunately, it's somewhat common, particularly in certain cities where premiums are really, really high. 
um, for doctors to practice without malpractice insurance. Now, you're allowed to do that in Florida. In fact, as long as you have it posted publicly that you don't have malpractice insurance and you can show financial um, backing that you'd basically be able to pay for a claim if you were sued, legally, you can do that. You can practice without it in the state of Florida. But it is somewhat problematic if you do decide to take that risk, because obviously, first and foremost, you're on the hook for any potential losses, right? So if you get sued, you're the one that has to find the defense attorney. You're the one that has to pay the legal fees. You're the one that has to help find the expert witness and pay the expert witness fees. You're paying the court fees. You're obviously paying for any losses if there's any claims um, paid out against you. So you have that financial Um, burden that you're taking on if you go bare. But the other thing that you have to be careful of is once you go bare, it becomes a little bit harder if you want to switch and buy insurance again in the future. Because from the carrier's perspective, if you've gone three years without malpractice insurance, you actually are a little bit higher risk than a doctor who has been um, adequately insured for that same amount of time. Because if they now insure you and a claim comes in, they could potentially be left on the hook for something that you previously didn't have coverage for. So carriers don't necessarily like to offer coverage or offer quotes to doctors who have been bare, especially if you've been bare for a long amount of time, but it's not necessarily impossible to do so. And this all has to do with the state of the malpractice market. So if it's a soft market, meaning there's a lot of available carriers, premiums are fairly competitive, you probably have a better chance of finding a competitive option. If the market is harder, which means there are fewer available options and premiums are higher, it probably will be harder for you to find something that will be a fit, if anything at all. So my advice to this provider was, we can certainly shop around. We can see if anybody would be willing to offer coverage. Now, I can't make any promises that it's gonna be affordable because rates in that particular area are still kind of high. But you can always work with an agent and shop around and just keep an eye on how things are going in the marketplace. And then you can decide if it might make sense for you to go ahead and buy your own insurance again instead of just going bare in the future. If you have any questions on these topics or you want to make sure that you are covered appropriately, click the link in the description box below where you can connect with us via phone, email, or chat today. And if you're listening, please visit us online at aegismalpractice.com. That's A-E-G-I-S, malpractice.com. And don't forget that our mailbag link is now live on our website. So if you have a question that you'd like me to answer here on the podcast, check out the link below where you can drop us a line and ask your question. Or schedule a quick 10-minute phone call for a personal consultation to discuss your unique insurance needs. This is Jennifer Wiggins. Thanks for joining us.